Kenneth. The museum's mission is to explore the legacy of the Jewish experience in Oregon, teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust, and provide opportunities for intercultural conversation. We challenge our visitors to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. We offer all of our virtual programming, including today's event, recordings of past events without charge. We'd be so grateful for any donation that you might be able to make to help us to continue to offer our broad range of programming. I'm really delighted that today's program focuses on the Portland Open Space Sequence, a series of interactive fountains, plazas, and connecting pathways in South Portland, designed by Lawrence Halprin and Associates between 1963 and 1970. In 1970, at the dedication of the newest of the four, the Forecourt, Forecourt Fountain, also known as the Ira Keller Fountain, architectural critic Ada Louise Huxtable described it as, quote, one of the most important urban spaces since the Renaissance. For any of us who grew up steeped in Huxtable's razor sharp interpretation of contemporary architecture, it's hard not to be impressed by the weight of her praise. Yet we're also aware that the fountain plazas and the redevelopment of South Portland that took place in the 1950s and 1960s eradicated a neighborhood that had been home to Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe and other immigrants from Italy and elsewhere. Halprin's innovative designs will be the subject of the exhibition Lawrence Halprin Fountains, which opens at the Oregon Jewish Museum on June 23rd. This exhibition joins a companion exhibition at the Architectural Heritage Center, South Portland, and the long shadow of urban renewal. We're also really delighted that the Architectural Heritage Center and the Halprin La Landscape Conservancy are partners with today's program and also with our summer walking tour program, which will tour parts of South Portland and the Fountain Plazas. These are scheduled to begin on July 6th. We're gonna be offering a tour a week throughout the summer, and you'll soon find information on our website and the other websites about the tours. I'd like to welcome Val Valestrom, Education Director at the Architectural Heritage Center, and Karen Whitman, Executive Director at the Health and Landscape Conservancy, each we're going to say a few words. Welcome, Val. Right, thank you. Yeah, we're, uh, <clears throat> as Judy mentioned, I'm Val Ballastrom. I'm the Education Manager at the Architectural Heritage Center. Uh, we're really happy to be part of this uh, uh, program and partnering in with the uh, Jewish Museum and the Center for, excuse me, and, excuse me, let me slow down. <laughs> We're very happy to be partnering with the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education and the Halpern Landscape Conservancy on today's program. Um, if you don't know about us, the Architectural Heritage Center uh, or the AHC as we, we shorthand it, uh, we're a hub for supporting Portland's diverse architecture and culture. Um, as the city grows and changes, our work um, ensures that people don't lose the connections between people and place the past and the future. Uh, we offer a range of public programs, if you're not familiar us, with us, uh, digital projects uh, on our website, uh, talks and discussions, walking tours, and exhibitions that explore how architecture intersects. Uh, we're based in a historic building on Grand Avenue in the Central East Side, the West Block. Uh, it's actually the oldest standing building on Grand Avenue, uh, which, we've, which was retrofitted into a public center uh, and opened in 2005. Our current exhibit at the AHC is a companion to the Jewish Museum's upcoming exhibit on Lawrence Halpern uh, because uh, our exhibit uh, examines urban renewal in South Portland that led up to and includes the design of the Halpern Fountain sequence. Uh, through photographs, maps, advertising, official correspondence and more, the exhibit at the AHC looks at the logic and motivations of city leaders beginning in the 1950s, as they focused on the redevelopment uh, in the South Portland area. Uh, the, city sh the exhibit shows how urban renewal impacted residents, businesses, and property owners in one of the city's most diverse neighborhoods at the time and steered Portland toward a modernist and meticulously planned aesthetic. Uh, so we'll ho we hope that you'll come and check out the AHC's exhibit as well as the o OJM's exhibit on the uh, on Lawrence Halpern and our gallery, if you're not aware, is open 
to visitors uh, Thursday through Saturday, 11 to 5. And you can always check out our website, visitahc.org, for most up-to-date information. Thanks. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. I'm, I'm so pleased to greet all of you as a co-sponsor of today's talk by Kenny Halfen, who the Halfen Landscape Conservancy really considers a foremost authority on the work of Lawrence Halfen. Um, and for those who may not know much about the Conservancy, I thought I would share the mission of the organization that was written in 2008 at the founding of the organization. It says, to maintain the historically significant Halpin parks to the level of a resident garden, make needed changes acting as the primary resource of the original vision of Lawrence Halpin, and to increase the awareness of the parks. So from 2008 at the founding, thoughtful planning for literally years led to the most visible project that brought attention to both the sequence and the conservancy. And that was a decision of the board of directors in 2014 to make the commitment to restore the sequence. Using the rapidly approaching 50th anniversary as a milestone, the plan was to address the critically needed capital repairs, but most importantly, to reverse the loss of visitors. Sadly, the Portland open space sequence was pathetically invisible. So after five years in a public private partnership, we had raised $4 million, our private sector partners were 17 property owners who taxed themselves to a total of $2.15 million, which gladly leveraged another 1.85 million from the city. We completed our construction and we celebrated that accomplishment in 2019 by inviting Portlanders to the grand opening. Throughout all these years, the board of, direction, board of Directors of the Conservancy has been a leading voice and leading discussions about neighborhood opportunities, but none more important than a program we call Adopt-A-Park that launched this past March. Through an agreement with the city, the Conservancy raises a $50,000 annual budget to work alongside parks personnel toward a united goal. Let me tell you what the goal is, to maintain the parks at the level of a resident garden. Sound familiar? Also, we recently initiated the plan to get the fountains turned on after a one and a half year hiatus. So we will be ready to host the tours you have planned for the summer. As stewards of the Lawrence Halpern vision, the work we do today is testament to the words that Lawrence Halpern himself uttered on the opening day of the Keller Fountain. We're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Karen. And, and yes, the fountains are on, so I urge everyone to get down there and take a look. Now it's really my pleasure. I'm just delighted to welcome the exhibition's cur guest curator, Halpern Authority, Kenneth Halfand, Philip H. Knight, Professor of Landscape Architecture Emeritus at the University of Oregon. Kenny's gonna speak to us about Lawrence Halpern and these beautiful fountains, what we hope will whet your appetite to come and visit our companion exhibitions. Please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A. We hope to have a lively conversation following Kenny, Kenny's opening remarks. Welcome, Kenny. Uh, thank you, Judy. I'm going to now share my screen, right, and good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the museum and the co-sponsors. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, I have to start with sad news. Anna Halperin, the legendary dancer, choreographer, and life and uh, wife of Larry Halperin, died today. She was 100 years old. Uh, you'll hear about her and hear about her influence on her husband in a few moments. These were two great artists whose work was intertwined. Uh, and in conversation with Judy just earlier, 
we've decided that the exhibit at the OJM CHE will be in fact in her memory. So now I'll start where I planned on starting. Uh, if this was a live group, I would ask you now to raise your hands, but just think of the following questions. Have you been to the FDR Memorial? Have you been to Freeway Park in Seattle? Have you been to Sea Ranch? Have you been to Four Court Fountain or Lovejoy Plaza? Have you been to Yosemite in the last 10 years? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you've been introduced to just some, just some of Larry Halperin's key designs and his work. To me, the mark of a great designer is an individual who responds to the passions and issues of his time, knows and understands places, and has the skill and imagination to employ that knowledge. I wanna talk about one such designer, of course, Larry Halpern, but try to put his work in the context of his time and place. All American landscape architects are indebted to Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of Central Park. In the second half of the 20th century, I think Larry Halpern could lay claim to being an updated heir to that most venerated designer and public figure. He embodies the most essential characteristics of his legacy. Olmsted profoundly believed, profoundly believed that contact with the natural world was beneficial, an uplifting moral and ethical force, and an aesthetic response to nature combined with a social purpose is at the heart of the profession of landscape architecture. Halpern reaffirmed and even extended this when he said, landscape design is about social relevance. It can become poetic and symbolic, but perhaps most importantly, it can articulate a culture's most spiritual values. Like Olmsted's, Halpern's career is characterized by his engagement with the arts, passions, and actions of his time. As a young man, this included the founding of the Jewish homeland in Palestine. World War II was the for formative experience of his generation and as a designer responding to post-war America, a place of growing affluence, development, suburbanization, and urban renewal. Halpern engaged the project types of his day, the suburban shopping mall, the freeway, urban reclamation, revitalization of center cities, adaptive reuse of places, and the beginnings of ecological design. He was born in 1916, raised in Brooklyn, New York. He attended a private school where he excelled as an athlete. Upon graduation, he spent the next two years in Israel, but returning to the States, he studied plant science at the University of Wisconsin, where he met and married his wife, the dancer Anna Schulman, who I just mentioned. On her suggestion, they visited Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin East, sparking an interest in architecture. A visit to the library led him to Christopher Tunner's book, Gardens in the Modern Landscape. The place and the book were both epiphanies that influenced his decision to become a landscape architect. And he was soon attending Harvard's Graduate School of Design. In this picture, the picture, the two individuals you see on the right are Anna Halperin and Larry Halperin at a performance while he, while he was a student and she was dancing at Harvard. World War II interceded and he joined the Navy where at the Battle of Okinawa, a kamikaze plane hit his destroyer. The Navy had taken him west and at war's end, he sought work in San Francisco which emerged in the post-war decades as the American Center for Landscape Design Innovation. These formative professional and professional experiences were the foundations of his career, grounding in the world of plants and science, the excitement and promise of modernist design in the profession of landscape architecture, the collaborations with Anna and her career as a choreographer, and a response to his time and places and where he lived. By the way, this individual, this picture, Anna lent to me or gave to me, it is her, was her favorite picture of the two of them. In a career that spanned six decades, he continued to evolve and respond to new influences. Yet there were places that became personal touchstones, Israel, the Sierras, Sea Ranch, and his home. Places and experiences that he often returned to for inspiration and solace. Israel was first. Halpern's personal relationship with the land and the state of Israel lasted almost 80 years. In 1993, in a letter to his granddaughter, Lavana, before his first, her first trip there, he wrote, my early memories are of a family deeply involved in Zionist ideals of Jewish study and social reform, of political and philosophical involvement, and a burning desire to improve the world and concern for Israel. He spent two years in Israel after high school, and most importantly, became involved with a group of young people who would establish a kibbutz. And kibbutzim at the time were in their pioneering idealistic stage, experimenting with forms 
of communal social life. Israel was close to his heart, but the other landscapes were closer to his California home and exemplified a cross section of the state from the rugged Pacific shore to the crests of the Sierra. Both of these landscapes were truly sublime where nature's power and magnificence is in dramatic presence. Sea Ranch was the site of his grand experiment in ecological design and where he built a cabin. 200 miles to the east of Sea Ranch was the Sierra Nevadas. Hiking in this terrain, Halpern discovered what he called the gardens of the high Sierra. And these are some of his drawings that he did while there. It was his astute recognition that gardens are created by acts of the mind as well as the hand. And that in the unadorned and unadulterated forms of nature, there were gardens, places of beauty, wonder, and delight. In these gardens, he saw evidence of how natural process had created these places and that process and product were integral, even called them synonymous. In this high country, he saw how he said, the powerful yet refined order of nature opened up a vast aesthetic territory that transformed my approach to design. The third touchstone was his home, located in Marin County on the slopes of Mount Tamalpais and embedded in a redwood madrone and oak forest just over the bridge from San Francisco where he worked. For 60 years, his daily life oscillated between the poles of a semi-wild landscape of his home and his urban environment. His first professional job was with the landscape architect, Tommy Church, whose succinct message was carried in the title of his book, Gardens Are For People. Halpern's final work in the office before he founded his own firm in 1949 was the Donnell Garden in Sonoma, recognized as one of the landmarks of modern design. Throughout the 1950s, the, his work was predominantly residential. He designed almost 300 private, 300 private gardens, mostly early in his career. Like many designers, the earliest work was for family members. It, originally here for his, his in-laws, the Schumanns, he designed their home south of San Francisco. At his home, however, the conventional California deck took on a different life as the dance deck designed for Anna's performances and teaching. In the lower right there, Halpern's on stage and Anna is watching the performance there. In the dance world, this became a famous stage and ultimately a pilgrimage site for designers and choreographers and the site for their first collaborative workshops. In 1950, the Kegel Garden helped put Halpern on the design map. It was published internationally. It was the only illustration for a House Beautiful article entitled the garden of the next America is an outdoor room. Along with the roof gardens on the Simon roof garden that you see there in the McIntyre garden, these three gardens were illustrated in the Museum of Modern Art's landmark exhibit on modern gardens in the landscape. His first book of several, 1963 was entitled Cities. Here in the book, he set out an agenda and its message was clear. He exhorted that a city he said should provide a creative environment for people to live in with freedom of choice in generating a maximum of interaction between people and their urban surroundings. His impact as a formal innovator is dramatically represented in his design of city spaces, but there's more. He wrote, what we are really searching for is a creative process, a constantly changing sequence where people are the generators, their creative activities are the aim and the physical elements of the tool tools. In this prescient statement, Halpern laid out the qualities that would ultimately be embodied in his RSVP methodology. In the 1960s, he made a leap into the public arena and the next most exciting stage of his development. In a few short years, the office would acquire a national reputation for innovation, quality, and a range of full range of project types. The San Francisco Bay Area at the time was the epicenter for a dramatic cultural and social change that ultimately became characterized as the 60s. Larry and Anna engaged many of these developments and absorbed others. The human potential movement, the counterculture, environmental psychology, urban revitalization and preservation, environmentalism and ecology. His designs attempted to infuse spaces with a democratic and participatory ethic of the era. At Berkeley, he designed Sproul Plaza, the stage for the birth of Berkeley's free speech movement in 1964. In the early 70s, the heyday of the Alpern office in its first incarnation, it truly was a trailblazing enterprise. It was the office 
that one looked for innovation and where landscape architects inspire, aspired to work. The earliest forays were commercial. In 1956, the shopping center was a new building type at an old orchard in Skokie, Illinois, outside of Chicago, a group of buildings clustered around a series of outdoor spaces that he described in his design as a series of shopping gardens. But a few years later, Halperin and the architect William Worcester collaborated on a different kind of commercial environment, the landmark preservation and transformation of the Giardelli Chocolates Factory into Giardelli Square, the first successful adaptive reuse project in the United States and a landmark in both historic preservation and in urban design. It was a resounding economic and social success and became the prototype for scores of rehabilitation preservation projects and festival marketplaces. Halperin said that Giardelli was in a sense a prototype of what a city could be. The office's main emphasis was in the urban a realm of urban design. But in the 60s, the American city was in crisis. Urban renewal, despite good intentions, was seen as a failure. Suburbanization was rampant. City life was often seen as undesirable and dangerous. Going against the grain, Halperin wrote, we believe that existing cities are salvageable, but require enormous effort to reconstitute. In this, they require the participation of the people who live in them, and we involve ourselves deeply in interaction with them, as well as the physical environment. One response was the creation of downtown pedestrian malls. Despite good intentions around the country, most fails, but not Halpern's. Several factors made Nicolette Mall in Minneapolis unique. Most importantly, it was not conceived as purely pedestrian, but designed as the nation's first transit mall. It offered improved environment for pedestrians, accommodated buses and taxis, but no cars. The mall received national recognition and became the prototype and inspiration for other transit malls. Denver's 16th Street Mall, Charlotte's builds Mes Virginia's East Main Street and Portland's Downtown Transit Mall, Charlotteville and Portland's both designed by Halpern. In the 1967, in concert with the construction of BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, Halpern began plans for the redesign of San Francisco's Market Street. The street terminated near the Embarcadero, now called Justin Herman Plaza, a vast brick plot space inspired by Italian piazzas. Halpern said that the plaza is a theater for events to happen. As a centerpiece, he outlined the concept for a grand interactive fountain. In the 1960s, California was a national leader in environmental and in educational innovation, and Halpern designed several college campuses. The newly established University of California at Santa Cruz wanted a distinctive campus designed to support its unique educational program, a cluster of residential colleges modeled on Oxford and Cambridge, but here embedded in a redwood forest. Where Harp Halpern, though, was a true elevator and an innovator was the design of the public fountain. In a series of designs here in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, Denver, Fort Worth, Rochester, he reconceived and reimagined the design of the fountain and the character of American civic spaces. At the Seattle Center, he designed the master plan for the World's Fair and its subsequent transformation into a park and a cultural center. The water sparkler used the forms of technology of contemporary standard agricultural irrigation equipment in an entirely novel way. Subsequent water gardens employed the concrete forms of the city. Here in Portland, he designed the open space system for the urban renewal district that featured a progression of spaces and two, included two grand civic fountains, the subject of the exhibit at the museum. Lovejoy Plaza, 1966, Forecourt, now the Ira Keller Fountain, 1970. These were true innovations, radical reconceptions of the urban fountain, both in form and function, and inspired by Halpern's study of water in the Sierras. But in lieu of imitating those environments, the fountains abstracted the forms in concrete. These were conceived of places of performance where people were permitted, even invited, to participate in the fountain's landscape. He wrote, the essential purpose of a design is to create the possibility for events to happen. And a bit of hyperbole and as an indicator of their importance and the excitement they created, and Judy quoted this already, Ada Louise Huxtable said that Forecourt Fountain was one of the most important urban spaces since the Renaissance. These two, two dramatic fountains are simultaneously urban waterfall, urban plaza, 
and water garden. It was strikingly imaginative innovations and a catalyst for conceiving new possibilities for civic spaces. His design philosophy gleaned principles from the natural world, but did not engage in mimicry or replication. If the 19th century park was a ruse in herb, a piece of the rural world in the city, fragments of rural nature, these were natura, nature in herb, abstractions of more wild nature in the city. Portland had offered Halpern the opportunity to transform his observation of water and rock gardens in the high Sierra into civic spaces. His Sierra drawings were a form of field research. These studies in what he called the ecology of form became concept drawings for the fountains. Lovejoy was built first. It is a grand environmental sculpture of terrace concrete constructed on a module using contemporary two by sixes as, a form, as form work. Unlike the brutalism of many architects of the age, Halperin's use of concrete proved not to be inviting, not repelling. Iris Fountain encompasses an entire 200 by 200 foot Portland city block. Channels with pebble surfaces suggested, tr suggesting tributary streams lead to rectilinear platforms and pools. The water trickles over small cascades suggestive of rapids. Then like a mountain stream, the water abruptly spills over monolithic blocks into the basin below. And it's wonderful to hear and the fountains have been running again recently. If you've not been, go back and see them. Following in the footsteps of the Portland projects was the development of Seattle's Freeway Park. Interstate highways eviscerated cities, literally, literally slicing through their fabric. Freeway Park is built over 10 lanes, lanes of I-5. In the heart of Freeway Park are two great water features, a central plaza and a cascade. Angela Dinajeva, who had worked with Halperin on Forecourt Fountain, was the associate in charge of design and brought her Bulgarian stage set and film design background to the project as she had at Forecourt. Once again, Halperin was a trailblazer. Freeway Park was the first park built on the air rights over an interstate. In Denver, ha there it is in more detail. In Denver, Halperin looked to the Rockies for the inspiration for Skyline Park. Noticed by few visitors, the park could also function as a stormwater detention basin, now a common design firm concern, but rarely addressed at this time. While the city was his primary concern, Halpern directed his energies to a broader arena. In the early 60s, he was involved in a landmark collaborative project on the wild Northern California coast, 100 miles north of San Francisco at Sea Ranch. His methodology is encapsulated in, encapsulated in what he called an eco-score diagram, a logarithmic spiral timeline that graphically represents the interaction of geology, sea, climate, vegetation, wildlife and human intervention. He said his goal was to inhabit this land and project, protect the awesome character without softening or altering it. Halperin would build his own cabin at Sea Ranch. And while the guidelines suggested not building on the bluff, his cabin not only was on the bluff, but canter lead over, over it. The view for the primes is of this variegated shoreline and rock rock outcribes he drew constantly. From his sea ranch house, nature is surveyed in its most powerful and primordial. There was a self-consciousness about the design process that's central to Halperin's work and legacy. It's grounded in the unique collaboration with his, the, his wife, Anna Halperin. From Anna, Larry adapted, adopted and adapted the language of dance as the dominant metaphor to describe and explain his process, work, and aspirations. He continually spoke of scores, performance, choreography, motion, and dance itself. In his book, City, he had written, the city comes alive through movement and its rhythmic character structure, where urban elements are animated and contribute to the choreography of the city. His most articulate statement of his design process and method is described in his RSVP cycles. The letters referred to resources, scores, value action, and performance. P, the performance was the goal, what he aspired to be his impact as a designer. His attention to a graphic dimension of scoring, which he often used, it was, is, is, is significant. He said, people think in different ways, and I find that I think most effectively graphically. In 1966, and again in 1968, 
Larry and Anna offered a series of memorable joint workshops entitled Experiments in the Environment. They were a month long series of events at his home, Sea Ranch and, in, and the city of San Francisco, a domestic, a wild and an urban setting. What began as experimental workshops evolved into a method that engaged clients and ultimately entire communities in a process he called take part, his shorthand term for a participatory process. Many of these techniques, as designers well know, have become common professional practice. By 1970, his office had expanded to 450 individuals. He opted out, dissolved the office, and reestablished it more as an atelier. In this next period of his, of his work, his central effort was the design for the FDR Memorial. In one sense, it was one of his great, great, last great water environments. For Halpern's generation, FDR was the president. For him to be chosen to design the memorial went beyond the dramatic civic and patriotic aspects. It was personal. He labored on the project for almost a quarter century. The design was essentially completed by 1978, but construction didn't begin till 1991. The memorial is constructed as a progression through four great rooms, each representative of the four terms of Roosevelt's presidency. The memorial is composed much like a symphony a score with four movements that Halpern characterized as an experiential history lesson. One of his next projects was the corporate headquarters of the Levi Strauss Corporation, nestled at the foot of San Francisco's iconic Telegraph Hill, only blocks from his office. The hill abuts one side of the plaza, the bay the other. The parks bifurcated into two segments deftly united, a hard surface plaza and a green pastoral park. Both sections feature water features, but of dramatically different types. The source of the water in each is a grand fountain where water emerges from stone. In the plaza, a huge back of quarried granite from uh, Halpern's beloved High Sierra is a dramatic sculptural statement. Throughout all these professional incarnations, Halpern worked in Israel, the location of his only significant international work. He designed the central plaza of the Hebrew University Givat Ram campus, in Jerusalem, he designed the entry promenade to Jerusalem's modernist Israel Museum. He was a key member of Mayor Teddy, Teddy Kollek's Jerusalem Committee, an assembly of international advisors to consult on the design and planning of the reunited cities. For years, though, Halpern would channel his energies into the Armon Hanasiv project on a hill overlooking the old city of Jerusalem, creating a design of lasting significance. In his first notes there, he was taken by the incredible view, perhaps the most awe-inspiring urban view of the world. is a quality of ageless urban landscape quality that's ineffable. The city and the landscape make an organic whole, inseparable. The view must be kept in our entire planning, not only the ridge, but the slopes. A great promenade is enough, a great piece of theater. So he designed a great promenade, the Haas Promenade, a grand belvedere in the literal meaning of the term, a place offering a beautiful view oriented towards the old city. The shape of the land is a grand amphitheater accentuated by the great arc of the promenade. The view affords a map-like overview, a place to place things into perspective, a place where people point, identify, and learn the landscape. The collective design rises to the level of its honored situation. The design embraces the landscape where the weight of history, faith, and daily life occupy equal status. Despite health problems, Halpern remained active into his 80s and produced some of his most mature work, all in his beloved Sierras in San Francisco. In 1863, Frederick Olmsted had gone west, and his prescient 1865 report on the management of Yosemite, he anticipated that ultimately millions of people would visit. In his report, he advised building a loop road in the valley and from this to construct a few paths to points of view. Over a century later, Halpern would be called upon to redesign one such path, the way to the base of Yosemite Falls, the highest waterfall in North America and the most visited site in Yosemite. This was a rare late in life opportunity to return to the Sierra landscape that had played such a significant role in his life. The entire project was largely designed through sketches in the field. Everything was done to enhance the visual and kinesthetic, exper kinesthetic experience in a sequential progression and a measured passage to the falls. 
The design has a modesty, a level of restraint and maturity in the face of the grand sublime forces of a natural icon. The human hand of the face of nature is apparent, but the design epitomized his philosophy inspired by the Sierras. In his words, he said, studying the granite formations, rivers, lakes, and waterfalls, and their evolution form the basis of my design philosophy. I learned not to copy the forms of nature, but to understand the processes by which natural forms arise. Along with his contemporary landscape architect, Ian McCarg, Halperin was the great promoter and proselytizer for the role of landscape architecture and the significance of, of environmental design. He understood the value of communication, engaged the public in his books, his articles, exhibits, and a final project of posthumously published autobiography, A Life sent, Spent Changing Places. His work is derived from intense personal experience. It's passionate and idealistic. He was of, of, time, of his times, but a trailblazer. He worked at all scales and excelled as a site designer, the maker of memorable places. While his work may be seen as modern, it also has a striving for an archetypal quality. Halperin's love of stone and water and his fascination with their interaction is dramatic. By the way, the photograph of him on his left was Anna's fo favorite photograph of him. His, 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 it is present in his drawings in the Sierra and the Sea Ranch. The polarities of hard and soft stone, the most solid of materials, water, the primordial, primordial liquid with an infinity of product infinity of properties. It's tempting to see these as metaphors for his work. Stone representing the stability of form, the creation of a structure in which experience occurs in almost liquid manner, taking on the shape of its container. You're a witness and participant in a performance, the concept he held so dear and by which he evaluated the ses success or failure of design. One of Halpern's last works, Stern Grove in San Francisco, in 2005 is a masterpiece in stone with a quality he most desired, creating a place for performance is the raison d'etre of the design. Conceptually, the design is simple. A stage fronts a green meadow and ascending terraces, a stone amphitheater enclosed on all sides by a forest backdrop. A common first impression is that it resembles Machu Picchu. In seats on terraces, picnicking on blankets, over 12,000 persons can attend a stern grove summer performance. For the opening of the Grove in 2009, and shortly before his death, Anna Halperin, as you see, and you see her here, choreographed a performance entitled Spirit of Place. The stage and the amphitheater were inverted. On a rainy afternoon, the audience stood on a stage where the performance took place <clears throat> amongst tones and terraces. The work was personal, a gesture from wife to husband in honor of their years of collaboration. She said it was something I wanted to do for Larry. <clears throat> One can see in the Grove, the, the Grove's design, the germs of ideas that were tested together for over half century on the dance deck at their Marin County home. Thank you. I will now stop sharing. All right, um, Kenny, thank you so much. It, it was a fabulous overview and really allowed us to sort of put our own beautiful fountains in context. So thank you. And I think my first question, you know, given that um, we are today at the uh, death of Anna Halprin, will you just say something about um, Halprin's working methodology, his relationship to Anna and how, how significant she was as a working partner? And then perhaps expand on that because he worked with others. You mentioned, you know, someone who worked on the on the forecourt fountain and what was his relationship to others who worked with him in his atelier or in his studio? Well, there's two questions there. One has to deal with Anna and one has to deal with his, his work. Precisely. His relation to Anna is obviously they, they were married for way more than a half century um, and, uh, and their work evolved together. Um, she was studying dance in Wisconsin. They, when they met, he and when he went to Harvard to study landscape architecture, she was there as well and actually was asked by uh, the school at the time to help teach dance to design students, which I think was, was very interesting. I think the, the, the dance deck um, is the, the key place. There's this place where she was teaching and he was observing. I asked her, did he dance? He never danced. 
uh, not at least dance socially, he didn't dance on the dance deck, uh, but he drew it constantly in his notebooks. His notebooks are at the University of Pennsylvania Archive. There's 167 notebooks, over 50 years of notebooks, which constant drawings of people dancing. And he adopted, as I said in the talk, the metaphors of dance, of choreography, of scoring, of performance. These were central uh, to his thinking. And then they did these experiments, these experiment, these educational experiments in design together. I was privileged to be part of one. At, at, well, while I was a student at Harvard, they did one at MIT and, and it was extraordinary. Uh, so this was a, you know, a continuing uh, concern. Uh, the other, you say, people he worked with, Larry Hepburn had an office. Uh, he, he was not a sole, <laughs> sole practitioner. Uh, so his office, he assembled an office of individuals who worked with, with him for dozens and for some of them decades. People who were in experts in construction and planting and, and, uh, and supervision uh, who were you know, co-designers on things. And uh, that's true for, for, for any, virtually any office. On the other hand, or part of that is anything that came out of the office, he was in his hand. He directed it, uh, he was part of it, he conceived it, um, and nothing would happen without him. You know, and there, there, I mean, I could go through certain individuals, Angela Dinaja, who was, who was key on, the, on both Forecourt Fountain and, and, um, and Freeway Park. I mean, it was Sat Nishida, who was with him for many years, who was a key designer on many projects. Uh, and there's a whole set of other individuals as well. Um, there were also, his office was a training ground. Some of the leading landscape architects of the next generation worked in the Halpern office at some point. Pete Walker worked in his office. Rich Haig worked in his office. And these are uh, people well known in the design community and they got some of their formative experience there. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I heard you say the phrase um, in your talk today, but I've certainly heard you say it before that Halpern's work addresses the urban condition. Mm -hmm. And I really like you to um, say more about what you mean by that phrase, addressing the urban condition. Well, I think it, he, uh, it, the book I mentioned 19, the sick, uh, I showed a thing of his books, uh, Cities. Uh, when he wrote that book, he had done none of these large projects. Uh, and what the book is, is largely a compendium of photographs from his travels largely travels in Europe, a few in Asia and Israel and some other places, uh, and a few in the United States, but they were really a catalog of wonderful, wonderful spaces, things he was observing. Uh, how people you know, water dramatically, but seating and the way spaces are organized and the way streets are organized and, and all, and, and from the smallest details of construction to the largest way that cities are organized and arranged. And it became in some ways a, a kind of aspiration and catalog for him of what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So if you look at his designs like for Nicolette Mall and Market Street and so on, he and the office designed everything. They designed the catch basins, the lights, the waste paper baskets, as well as the kind of larger spatial range, all with the idea in terms of the urban condition, in terms of making places that are more livable and exciting and more communal for people. And I think the communal aspect, which I think uh, was really initiated, I'd say by some combination of literally growing up in New York uh, and then his experience in the kibbutz, that uh, the city is a communal place and how can design reinforce that community? And, and just thinking of the Portland open space sequence, um, do you know what Halprin felt when he first looked at the space. I mean, when he saw that space, most of South Portland, most of the buildings had been eradicated, not much had popped up yet. From anything I've looked at in terms of photographs or read about, it wasn't very pretty. So did he, did he sort of comment on the job given to him and how did he go about developing um, the- well, I think, you know the de I mean, designers, the task of a good designer is to kind of imagine, imagine the future and particularly in landscape design where you're, often, you're always dealing with things that are gonna grow. You have to anticipate not what it's gonna be like as soon as it's constructed, but it's, but it's long life over, over many years. Uh, the fountains in Portland, the Portland open day sequence is a half, over a half century old, mm -hmm. which is you know, a, a vast experience of time. 
Um, and also importantly, and Randy Gregg in his book about the sequence notes the, the political um, imagination really, particularly of Ira Keller of in, um, envisioning and making this happen at a time when frankly, Portland was a rather conservative city doing something that was incredibly imagined and, and innovative. It's also important to note, as you mentioned, that this was an urban renewal site. Um, and designers in the 60s were dealing with urban renewal sites. The history of urban renewal, urban renewal is complicated and much of it not positive, but he was dealt that hand in a larger framework that the uh, SOM, Skidmore Owings and Merrill firm had designed the larger, uh, had designed the buildings, but he then became responsible for those, all the spaces in between, not just the fountains, but all the walkways and all the, everything that connects it. Um, and a big part of the idea was that it was a progression that is a series of connections as you would walk through the city. That's great. And, and there is a question, which is a really good question. Um, why, why isn't the Halpern sequence more obvious for visitors to Portland? I, I have to say, I'd probably lived here for five years before I even heard about it. So it, it, did it, it, wasn't, it didn't become the magnet, I think perhaps at the time Ira Keller had hoped it would be. It is still very tucked away. Um, well, I, think, I think it is tucked away, well, there's two answers. That one, if you talk to any designer, an architect or landscape architect, this is the first place they go when they come to Portland. Yeah. Uh, it's like you, you want it, this is what you see. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is, its reputation is not, is international. It's known, it's in every textbook. It's, it's well known uh, and both in its own right and what it catalogs. Uh, I think why visitors don't see it is this, well, visitors come to the city, they stay in hotels and motels, they're downtown. Uh, those things are not immediately adjacent to the sea open space sequence. Right. Uh, and with the exception of the auditorium, which is critical because anyone going to the auditorium for all the events and performances that are does see the fountains. Unfortunately, Lovejoy is embedded in a residential area and what's surrounding it really doesn't support it. Um, it's surrounded by blank walls and parking structures right. um, as opposed to, frankly, the shops and cafes that ought to surround it. Uh, and hopefully in the future, those might materialize, uh, which I think would make it a, make it a destination. Mm -hmm. I think there's so. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll just mention um, a historian, a wonderful historian put in the chat that at 3rd and Lincoln at the Transit Mall, there is now a display talking about that, the fountains and really I think it is going to be an impetus, impetus to get people to yeah. walk through. Yeah. I will just ask a question because perhaps funnily enough, I, I have such a, a warm spot for the source fountain, the chimney. I don't know whether you want to. Can you just say anything about how he came to create that little- in, in, in the sequence, there's a small, which I didn't talk about here. It's a small little uh, pyramidable brick structure, which is seen as the source, uh, the source of this. Uh, there's, I think, a series of kind of places that inspired that uh, in terms of particularly the landscapes in the American Southwest, which Halpern spent a great deal of time in and actually worked with the Navajo Nation. And I think it's partly inspired that those kind of that. Um, yeah. uh, I don't think it's as frankly as as critical as as the other two. Yeah. No, I don't know why. It just yeah. moves me every time I see it. I can't explain it. If other people agree with me, put in the chat because I do love the other fountains. Is there? Um... There is a third space. There is a space in between the fountains, which is Petty Grove Park. Uh, so if th those are which is is part of the sequence is a green series uh, of mounds, uh, which are largely the, still the way they were designed. Yeah. And did he design, he designed the fountain there as well with the sculpture? Yes, yeah. And did oh, no, no, not that, no. He designed the mound part is all him, not, not the sculpture. Not the sculpture. So who, who has been heavily influenced on, uh, um, by him today? Can you name any projects or landscape architects Working since Halprin, whose work so clearly drew on the, his themes and motives. Well, well, one answer is, uh, frankly, any any landscape architect of the next generation is influenced by him. I mean, it's that kind of uh, influence, and the, the, the influence is in several ways. Uh, one is a methodology methodological influence, whether it's not necessarily the RSVP cycles, but his concept of scoring, 
uh, which is a kind of, well, particularly a kind of graphic method of describing places uh, and how that influences design. He and others as well are critical in thinking about participatory design um, and how you involve individuals in the design process. Um, and he did this for whole cities, not just for communities. Um, and that's become common professional practice as well. Uh, the sense of that a, a fountain uh, could be a kind of grand civic space as a kind of magnet, but also that you'd participate in it, that you're part of it is very much. So I would say, you know, there's not any kind of single, there's not a single person who, you know, like I worked for him and then I do Halperin like things. Uh, and I think fortunately not, you don't see things that are imi directly imitated. Um, there's another imi uh, thing that's critical for designer is he, his, he was incredibly skillful in his craft and very proud of the fact that any, he could do everything that landscape architects do. He knew plants, he knew construction, he knew design, he knew engineering, he knew planning. He knew how he was great uh, uh, at getting work, a great speaker, a great promoter, a great writer. Uh, and I think people have learned from that dramatically. And there's much more to be learned as well. Yeah, I mean, to, to carry on, um... Ada Louise Huxtable's use of the word renaissance. He was such a renaissance man, right? Uh, there's a couple of, of questions or, or comments in the chat. He was obviously such an exquisite um, uh, draw artist. Thank you, artist. <laughs> what was, well, that was just intuitive to him? Was no, he, no, he, he uh, drew since childhood. Okay. He, his art, I mean, since childhood, there's, I just showed one drawing from his drawings. In the Navy, he does a credible series of drawings in the Navy. There's a story, in fact, that the drawings he was doing in the Navy, he was passing another ship and not knowing whether what was he was going to survive, passed it through his drawings to another ship. Uh, and those were ultimately ultimately saved. He kept journals, both kept journals where he painted and wrote. Uh, and these, as I mentioned now at the archive at the University of Pennsylvania, I've looked at all of them, in fact. He was a great portraitist. He did wonderful portraits of individuals, of people, which he never, rarely published. Uh, the, the title image I used here in his own book, he ends his book with a series of like 40 or 50 self-portraits he did over his entire life that to me reminded me of portraits that uh, both Picasso and Rembrandt did, which went through their lives and showed an aging process as well. Um, and he described himself as an artist, and Anna said, you know, he, uh, he drew, continued to draw for his entire life. Was there resistance to his work? I mean, I, I, he, he was, in the photos you showed of him, he was clearly, he himself, a people person. He wanted these fountains used. You know, I'm thinking of being in Paris and walking in the gardens there and needing to be upright and well-dressed, right? So nobody sort of pushed back against this idea of creating um, creating fountains where you're actually- Well, that, that, that's where I think he, you know, he's, it's the right person for the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the 60s, were, you know, where he was in California, which was particularly receptive to things, and most of his work is in the West, but not entirely. Uh, he was in an environment, uh, and many of you think of most of these places where life is lived out of doors, um, in, the, in a Cal much of California for, particularly, uh, which was receptive to that. There is also, in any design firm, a list of projects that were started and never commit and completed, sure, or sure. they only got to phase one, or they didn't do, his, do everything as, uh, in the way he would have wanted, and, and every designer has those and those that he as aspired to have. And, that's that's the subject for a different talk. <laughs> um, someone's just a asking the order in which you think people should go: Chimney, Lovejoy, Petty Grove, Keller, or the other way. What what? what? I, you can start at Keller and work your way slightly up the hill, or work your way down. I I don't think that matters. Um, uh, I do think seeing that when you go to the Ira Keller Fountain, you tend to stand in front of it and in, in front of the theater and see this great waterfall. I always think it's better to start at the top uh, as it slopes down because the water it really is intended like a spring coming out of the rocks of the city. And you can follow the course of the water because it's a, 
in both fountains, the water is a kind of grand metaphor or analog of water in the natural environment. At Lovejoy Plaza, it begins in a spring on top of the fountain out of the rocks. At Forecourt, it begins out of the rocks of the city. It slowly gathers itself, then becomes like springs do in the Sierras and dramatically in the Cascades, a waterfall. And then it ends, both of them end in, in flat water in, in a metaphorical, if you will, lake or, uh, or, or ocean. Hmm. Is this firm still going? Someone is asking. The firm, no. Okay. Okay. The firm so, ended with him. Although there are people, and I think some of them are probably watching, uh, who who worked were, worked for him, uh, and all of those individuals, anyone who worked for him uh, in any capacity, has their own tales and stories about him, his personality, um, which was um, strong, to put it mildly. Uh, and that's yeah, no more to say. Yeah. Um, someone is asking, did he have any relationship with Frank Lloyd Wright, or were there? In, in addition, I would just throw in other well-known architects or landscape architects. Well, not personally with Frank Lloyd Wright, although he's, as I mentioned in the talk, he was inspired literally by Anna taking him to see Taliesin right. in Wisconsin, literally inspired by that. And he had great admiration uh, for Wright, but there was no personal uh, relationship. There, there were many Siri architects he, he worked for and was particularly close to, particularly close to the work of Louis Kahn. Uh, the Philadelphia architect, not in working together, although they did some things uh, in association, uh, but in um, in both instances, seeking something, uh, if you will, kind of primal or archetypal uh, in their designs. They had that affinity. Yeah. So uh, but the other architect was William Worcester in, in San Francisco, and they designed a series of projects together, a housing project, generally square most dramatically, but also a series of significant housing projects uh, in the Bay Area. And thinking of the forecourt fountain, someone is asking, did he design the fountains that people would play in the pools? It, it seems awesome. Did he, did he intend that? Absolutely. He was, yes. And they're designed such a way in forecourt, especially the upper basins, people worry about people falling off or jumping in. They're designed in such a way that one can stand in them. They're like three feet deep. Uh, in, in, a in, in a comfortable fashion. Um, and in, depending in Portland and other places on the rules and regulations uh, of what people can do. I've seen kids uh, take dirt bikes down Lovejoy Fountain. <laughs> I love it. Um, just going across the country for a minute. Someone asked a question I'm not, I'm, I'm not familiar. Um, so if you could just comment on Halprin um, about Lady Bird Johnson's request to fix Washington DC. Did Halpern, you know, I know she was all about beautification. Do you know anything about that? Did Halpern... uh, no, I, I, no, I don't know about the connection. Okay. It's, it's likely, but I don't. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, there was another question here. No, I lost it. Oh, something about the design of New York's Little Island in the Hudson River, which was designed by Thomas Heatherwick. Did that um, is that, would you say that was influenced by Halpern's design principles? Or would he have approved of it? I guess that's the question. I, I, it's hard to say whether he approved of it. I've, I've just seen bits and pieces of the design, which is a, a bit of a kitchen sink. It's like a, it, there's all kinds of stuff in there. He certainly would have approved of what has happened on the west side of Manhattan and the east side of Manhattan in terms of the reclamation of the waterfronts uh, in both instances. Um, and which is really the next generation of design in American cities as the morphology of cities, Portland and other cities, yeah, virtually every city that was a port city has now been reclaiming its waterfront uh, for public uses. And he would certainly be excited uh, about that. Um, be, I think his design response would be rather different than what Heatherwick did though. Got it. Yes. So we're just we're at the top of the hour. I think um, we're going to take one or two more questions and then we'll um, let our esteemed speaker go. Um, this is a really interesting question that just came through and it, it sort of alludes back to Halpern's character. What boundaries did he maintain with during the community engagement process that allowed him to the formal and aesthetic precision so consistent throughout his work? So he's, you know, he's, he has this incredible work ethic. Um, he's working, you know, with committees and zoning laws and everything else. How did he? How did how did that process work? 
and what boundaries did he implement on his own to sort of maintain his aesthetic quality? There's always a question in, in working with the community of um, getting input from the community and Halperin had a whole series of methods for getting inputs from the community and when many of which are now part of professional practice uh, of you know, using large scale maps and plans, asking people to put their own designs on them, everyone from children to anyone in the community, to offering literally suggestions, you know, wish lists we would like, dot, 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 which are always longer than was possible, seeing what's most, what is most desired and wanted uh, within the community. And then it's with subs, you know, in his job and the designer designers is to take that input and then to translate that into physical form. Um, and typically to present it in terms of alternatives, not just here's the single one, but here's the other. The part of that is he certainly would manipulate things as I think most designers do in a direction based on that information that they, he, he or she thinks uh, is a desired outcome and with a particular kind of, a, certainly a, a certain aesthetic uh, in mind. Um, so there's a kind of push and pull uh, between that. Um, Sons, yeah. Was he? Would you say he was? Would have been easy to work with? Was he exacting? Was he collaborative? He well, he, I, I think some of that depended on personalities. He certainly uh, spoke of collaboration. I think his most dramatic and successful example of that collaboration was in the FDR Memorial. And if you go to the FDR Memorial, you know you go through these succession of rooms, each of which has a sculptural tableau. And there are four different sculptors that are part of that, George Siegel and Leonard Baskin uh, and, and two others, um, names for, I forgot for the second. He worked, with, he did a series of workshops with those four sculptors over a series of years in terms of the, the, the total design of the place, how their work would fit into it, what story they were gonna tell, how they were gonna tell the story. Uh, and that went back and forth between them. It was a great example of, uh, of a collaboration, uh, I think, at its most successful. And I think if you go to the FDR Memorial, you, 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 I think you, you see that. It's, uh, I think, an incredible project. Um, other ones would depend on the individuals and the communities and so on, but that's, you know, something that's iconic now for the nation. Uh, there's just a question about Sea Ranch and, and whether he ever said anything about the development and the evolution. Of he absolutely did. Uh, sea Ranch is a 10 mile stretch of the California coast. If you visit Sea Ranch, um, unfortunately there was a change in ownership in Sea Ranch. Uh, there's a whole set of uh, covenants of what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. So if you go to Sea Ranch, the first five miles, the Southern five miles are still pretty faithful to the covenants. The next five, there's things like houses on the bluff that shouldn't, shouldn't be there. He was in fact consulted uh, on changes that, that had been there uh, and, and, and visited visited it as did Anna for their entire life. Um, as did all the other designers, the architects at Sea Ranch, in fact, all have houses there, uh, every single one of them, uh, and take an active participation uh, within the design, with the design. And I think um, the design, I think at its best was something that has been dramatically modeled of how you not just preserve a landscape, but how you build in a landscape in a way that celebrates its properties uh, and qualities without destroying it. Thank you. Um, really, really appreciate this, Kenny. Thank you to the Architectural <laughs> Center and the La um, Halpern Landscape Conservancy. There, there's a question someone wanted to know how, if there's a walking tour online, I think it's the Halpern Landscape Conservancy. You can find a, a little tour online. I do urge you to visit our exhibits. Ours is opening at the Jewish Museum, June 23rd. The Architectural Heritage Center exhibition is already opened. And as I mentioned, we're gonna be doing walking tours, which are not only going to go through the um, plaza, but also into sites in South Portland where immigrants had lived and flourished. In fact, one of the things in my research I realized is that where the Lovejoy Fountain is just west of the Lovejoy Fountain was where the Jewish old people's home um, was situated. So it's going to be a great tour. So Kenny, did you want to I was just saying, if anybody wants to you know, contact me as any other question, want to contact me personally, feel free to email me. I'm hellfan at uoregon.edu. 
Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Look forward to seeing you at our museum when we reopen June 23rd. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Utterly wonderful. Bye.